think um, I was waiting for an introduction and I didn't hear one. So I hopefully, hopefully you all are hearing me. Um, so anyway, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here with you this afternoon to talk about the International Patient Summary. Let me go ahead and get my screen sharing, I guess, and get started on it. So let's see. Apologies for the brief delay there, a little bit of a technical glitch. Um, so uh, we're talking today about the International Patient Summary, the IPS, and moving from specification to global implementation. I'm glad to, <clears throat> to be here with all of you virtually. And first we'll talk, I'll say a little bit about who I am. Um, I go by Rob, I'm Rob Hausen, MD, and there's a few, a little bit more information about me. I'm a consultant, got my own consulting company, uh, my background as a family physician and also electrical computer engineer. It's always a health useful combination for the this kind of kind of work, but I'm a co-lead on the HL7 IPS project and I'm a consultant with the work in the GDHP, the Global Digital Health Partnership interoperability stream in the IPS work group of that. Uh, and I'm also co-chair in the Vocabulary and Orders and Observations groups. And I also do a lot of work with SNOMED and I'm one of the co-leads on the SNOMED on Fire project. So uh, this slide talks a little bit about some learning objectives, basically to, to basically, so you could describe what the purpose and the primary features are of the, of the FIRE International Patient Summary Standard. Hopefully we will we'll touch on that uh, a good bit. And to understand the collaborative process and the contributions from multiple SDOs that have been involved in developing and maintaining the standard and to be able to identify the planned IPS implementation strategies that we will, we'll be talking about. So to get started, let's talk a little bit about what the IPS is. And it's, uh, it's right there in the name is the international, uh, the I uh, patient summary. And so international is emphasizing the need to provide <clears throat> generic solutions for global application beyond any particular region or country. And it's a patient summary, meaning it's a health record extract comprising of a standardized collection of clinical and contextual information. And that can be retrospective or concurrent or prospective, um, but it provides a snapshot in time of a subject of care's health information. So that's what we're talking about. And uh, so the IPS is a, it's a focused patient summary, which uh, provides a healthcare summary for a citizen, uh, whatever country that would be of, uh, a citizen at the point of care. Uh, it's intended to be minimal and non-exhaustive. And we'll get more into the, what that means and what the reasons, some of the reasons maybe for it are as we go on. It's also intended to be specialty agnostic and condition independent. So it's not tied to any of those particular things, but it's, it's also still intended to maintain <clears throat> clinical relevance. So as a focus patient summary, it's designed to be both simple and implementable and to be usable at any time and any place by anyone and uh, tended to have multi multiple beneficiaries. Those could be individuals or healthcare providers or society at large, society as a whole. Those are pretty lofty goals, but maybe we'll, we'll see how, you know, how we're reaching towards those as we, as we go along here. So, all right, so a little more, uh, it's as you mentioned, it's already a, that it's a health record extract. It's a snapshot in time of a subject of care's information. It's international, you know, it's generic solutions for global application. And particularly it's scoped, it's designed for an initial, we designed it for an initial use case of unscheduled cross-border care, but it's also intended to provide a baseline that's usable also with other kinds of use cases, other scheduled or planned types of clinical care scenarios. So we're, you know, allowing for it to be hopefully as broad as, as possible. All right. So as being minimal and not exhaustive, you know, the minimal aspect uh, over there on the 
right hand side of the screen, it reflects the ideas of, of the notion of a summary and the need to be concise. Uh, it alludes to the existence of, you know, a core set of data items that ideally, at least, all healthcare professionals can use. So the idea of a summary is it's not the whole EHR, it's, it's hopefully pulling out the, the most relevant parts of the record and being able to provide those, you know, where they're needed, you know, in a subsequent encounter. And so being the non-exhaustive part of that is, you know, it doesn't pretend to accommodate all possible situations. It, it recognizes that the ideal data set is not closed and it's also likely to be extended. So we try to use an open design philosophy and allow for, you know, movement and evolution as the healthcare changes and, you know, hopefully the specification will be able to, will be able to deal with that. So being special diagnostic and condition independent does not imply that all the items in the data set are going to be used in every patient summary every time it's used. This basically is intended to be a starter set of data. It's to help inform a person's treatment at the point of care. And that is irrespective of the particular condition of the patient or, <clears throat> or of the healthcare provider that's trying to, the specialist or a GP, whatever it is, who's trying to manage the care. So this slide basically sh shows how IPS is there really to fulfill a clinical need. The need is we need some kind of an up-to-date summary that would be a, ideally at least available at, at the point of care anywhere in the world. And so with that need, then we need to build something for that. So we build a, a standardized set of clinical content that again is intended to be effectively utilized by any clinician anywhere. But obviously where we're in the process of this point is testing and verifying that that content both can be sent and can be received and can be understood. And uh, we're moving into the adoption and implementation phases, as we said at the outset. So once we're into that, then we will, you know, hopefully we'll be successful there and we'll be able to maintain and, and grow to better meet the needs as we go on to basically have a, uh, an ongoing feedback loop. That's, that's the, the goal and the intent. So this slide basically shows some of the notion of what, uh, a little more detail about what content may be in, you know, in an IPS. Uh, it breaks it down uh, with the, uh, on the left-hand side, a common set of basically what we would call header information, particularly if you're familiar with CDA, you know, the CDA header, this is very similar to that. You know, things you know, about what's the subject and the author and the attester and the custodian of, of this data. And then we have a set of required and recommended and optional sections that we've, we've specified. And, you know, the required ones you see here are, the, you know, medications and allergies and intolerances and, and clinical problems, the problem list. You know, basically, I think no summary would be very useful or complete without having information on those uh, critical items. And beyond that, there's you know, this other set of recommended sections, including the immunizations and you know, history of previous procedures, uh, you know, implanted or other used medical devices, and uh, diagnostic you know, test results, laboratory results, you know, typically, uh, as well as you know, radiology and others. But uh, you might be wondering already about uh, what, you know, whether some of those recommended sections might possibly uh, actually should be required. And one in particular that we will say a little bit more about, but certainly a, a topic of importance right now is the immunizations. And there has been some discussion about whether that should be made a required section. You know, right now it's still in the recommended uh, section, but uh, we're always trying to adapt to new situations. So. Uh, the other optional sections you see here, including the vital signs, and which aren't usually very useful in a summary, but sometimes they may be, but past history, pregnancy, social history, some of, all those things can be very important at some times, but, but aren't considered at the same level as the other sections, you know, for, for general uh, use on a, you know, on a most of the time or all the time basis. So they're, they're optional. Okay. So this is a little more about what's making up the IPS. And again, it's, it's, it, it, the notion is it's a document that's composed of reusable profiles. So you see again, the, the basic sections there in the middle, and then on the, moving over to the right, you see the, the library of profiles. So we have 
profiles on, again, vaccinations, as I mentioned, allergies, problems, results, medications, you know, and a variety of others. And those can be used uh, as a library. They can be used sometimes independently or, or bundled together as the document, and as, as it says here. So those are, those are all available. And uh, so the notion of the library, again, is something that might be you know, reusable, you know, basically building blocks. Again, these vaccinations or allergy data, all that can be used for other purposes. And so you, you know, with a variety of extensions, you might have multiple vaccination records and those could be used to, you know, for the WHO yellow card here, which is a typical example. This was, uh, of course, it's still relevant today, of course, but it's, uh, this was uh, more in the pre-COVID-19 days when, you know, we were not thinking about some of the more sophisticated things that we're having to, to deal with right now. But when we look at that, uh, if we envision a specialized IPS use, you may start with you know, that base, those, the basic data in those sections, and then you may want to supplement that with some additional data specifically relevant to, let's say, in, again, in this case, maybe COVID-19 and, and vaccinations for that, which may be, you know, have uh, you know, great importance and for, for multiple needs. And so if we take that and then we basically can then go a couple of different ways, we can go to uh, an IPS that's sort of enhanced for dealing with immunization. And, uh, or we could go directly to something like a fire, you know, a fire-based vaccination certificate. And with those, then uh, you can, that data can be used to and transformed into, you know, some kind of a digital certificate record. It's the various initiatives that we're hearing a lot about. And we anticipate that IPS can, you know, can and will be and should be used in that way. So this slide is basically showing a little bit, going back just a bit about where, where we came from and kind of how we got here. And uh, it shows some initial set of initiatives in Europe, which you probably can't read, and I can't really read either, actually, all the details of them. But just to say that there's a number of European projects that sort of were precursors to some of, the, of this work. And then around 2009, that started getting you know, looked at in the Joint Initiative Council, which is a, a group that involves these, these organizations and, and, and a number of others that, uh, you know, basically try to coordinate a lot of work. And so we can, you know, to help you know, the various standards organizations not duplicate each other's work, but work together and, and enhance the value of everyone's work. And with that review in the JIC, then we move forward and, you know, they produce the document called the patient summary standard set and and work around that ended up ultimately leading to uh, what we see you know in the ips standards here so, so that's sort of where we came from and uh and this is another one just to show in a slide that shows basically the fact that the work that we're talking about here is really a you know involving multiple organizations it's a cross sdo initiative it you know involves organizations including you know, of course, HL7 and IHE, we'll talk a little more about that. SNOMED International is involved in some of the terminology aspects. Uh, SEN, it was the European standards and then the, and that, you know, then the ISO standards on top of that for, for global use. It's all involved and it all, you know, all works, works together. So this is a slide shows a little more about the landscape and you can see here in the middle, we've got the you know, both a, an HL7 IPS Fire IG and a CDA IG. We have, you know, we have IPS in both both of our you know, primary HL7 standards, and those refer to the SEN and the, you know, and the European work that I mentioned, and you know, relate to this you know, terminology work in SNOMED and and particularly the SNOMED uh, free set for IPS, which is now the the GPS, the Global Patient Set talk about that and then the ISO standards kind of using those and globalizing them. So that's the basic way that all this lays out. Let's see. So one thing with all of that, with all these moving parts, with all these organizations involved and, and multiple standards involved, there's still one important thing and that is that there is only one IPS in FIRE. And uh, we've we basically, in our working together, we've agreed that that is to be the case. So the work that IHE is doing builds on 
the work uh, that HL7 has done to develop the standard and IHG helps to you know, test conformance and, and to further you know, refine it for various purposes, but it uses the work done in HL7 and also feeds that back you know, to improve the standard. And, and that's and basically the, the goal and the, uh, is to maintain only one uh, fire IPS standard going forward. All right, so you know this slide gives some links to where you can find all these standards, the IHE, uh, you know, PCC, and the IPS you know, profile, as well as the you know as the fire IG, and, and we'll see some more of those. But you can click on those links if you want to do that. And um, so we have all these things we're working together. We have the specific, you know, basically the implementation work in the middle done by HL7 and IHE and, and some in SEN, uh, you know, with the terminology work done by SNOMED, and the specifications at a, at a higher level, a logical level by SEN and ISO. And then we, you know, basically that all moves towards the, you know, how you, how do you, once you have these specifications, how do you test them and how do you assess whether you're complying with them, the conformity assessment, and that's Working, working on and basically in the connectathons that we do here in HL7 and FIRE, and as well as in I, the IHE connectathons. So we've just recently had a FIRE connectathon uh, in HL7 side, and we have an IHE connectathon coming up uh, next week. We'll be working with all of those. So this is, lists some of the multiple standards artifacts that are involved. We have the ISO draft standard uh, for the IPS data set, which is just recently approved just a, just a few months ago. And um, you know, the SEN <clears throat> work that's already been published on that, the, both the FIRE and CDA implementation guides from HL7, the IHE profile that you saw, and then the SNOMED global patient set that we use in the specification. And so basically we have this cross SDO effort uh, to promote IPS adoption. And you know, in that spirit, we have basically a, a couple of project groups and and regular meetings that we have and the, the HL7 group is working on uh, updating the standard and we have to incorporate some of the feedback we've had from previous ballots and, and connectathon experience and we'll be we're planning to publish uh, an STU update as soon as possible hopefully by you know, next month you know slipped a little bit at a time so I don't know for sure but it should be soon you know, regardless. And then we also have set up in order to try to keep our, uh, you know, keep a handle on all these various efforts across SDO collaboration group where we meet regularly, and, you know, biweekly uh, to, to focus on maintaining alignment and kind of dealing with uh, the policy and, and logical levels of how do we keep these specifications working you know, in, in, in well in concert as we, as we move forward. All right. So again, this just this shows a few more of the organizations that are involved in one aspect or another, and you know we're all working together with a, you know, on on the work in IPS, and we do it um, basically trying to be in close collaboration with real world projects. Again, you see a, a number of those here, and uh, just an idea that there's a, again a lot of a lot of different uh, interests and folks working together on a common goal. So with all of that, you know, with all this work, this cross SDO effort to develop the standards, um, and what have we learned so far with that? Well, we've learned, I think that cross SDO collaborations actually can work very well when we have a focused need for that. Uh, you know, IPS is something that's kind of brought us all together and we've been able to, you know, to manage to work out collaborations that we never really, you know, really had to do before, but we did it around this common use case and it's, it's actually worked pretty well. Each SDO can bring their own unique expertise and uh, oftentimes their tooling and various processes that they have to bring it to the table and, and we can all you know, benefit from that. And we develop a suite of artifacts that work together and ultimately are, you know, hopefully will help the end user. And growth and maintenance are things that we have to always keep in mind and key steps, uh, obviously, as we go forward and we try to keep on top of that you know, collectively. And, and, you know, these international collaborations really help, uh, you know, help by leveraging, you know, you know, help with the adoption and implementation and the work in the, the Joint Initiative Council, the JIC uh, that we talked about. And, 
and uh, also a global consortium for e-health interoperability, which is basically a work with uh, HL7 and HIMSS and, and Global Digital Health Partnership, which we'll be talking about just a little bit more here, uh, have all been very useful. So now we'll talk a little bit about what are some of the next steps uh, for us. We have a spec you know, specifications. And uh, now we need to take these specifications and move them into somehow into the real world. Because, you know, having a standard is, is pretty nice. It's a good thing to have, you know. But uh, in reality, it's, it's really a very little, if any, benefit unless, unless somehow it's widely adopted and used. I'm sure we can all think of great standards that have never really gained, uh, you know, traction, have never really, you know, lived up to their promise. And I personally, and myself, and of course, now all of us are working on it, we, we hope that that's not gonna be the case with, with IPS. We believe there's a, a real benefit from it and, and a use for it. And, but we, you know, we need to get it out there and, and actually use before we can, you know, you know, we can you know, prove that that is really the case. So with that, you know, we've got some implementation initiatives that we're trying to work on. A lot of this uh, I'll be talking about uh, you know, on this slide and then the subsequent slides is work that's in progress that we're trying to, to really get off the ground and um, make, you know, leverage all of the aspects we can. One of the implementation initiatives that, um, that basically is, uh, has been set up, it's independent uh, at a high level from IPS, but it involves and includes IPS as the Global Digital Health Partnership. It's, much, it's quite a bit broader, of course, but uh, within GDHP, there's an interoperability work stream. And, uh, and within the work stream, there's an IPS uh, work group. And the interoperability work stream is led uh, you know, from the US currently uh, by the, the ONC. And it has 31 member countries plus the WHO. And within that IPS work group in, you know, in GDHP, we have been setting some goals recently about what we want to see for IPS implementation. And uh, you know, the, the goals that have been set currently are to have 10 countries that would be able to implement IPS in some kind of a pilot project by the end of this year. Uh, it's a pretty lofty goal, but uh, you know, we're, we're pretty, you know, hopefully we'll be able to, you know, to get there. And beyond that, you know, we're targeting 20 countries to implement uh, with at least 10 of those in some kind of production use by the end of, of 2022. So that's uh, what's happening in, in GDHP. And then the global consortium that I just mentioned a minute ago with HL7, IHE, and, also, and HIMSS working together are also working on some you know, implementation efforts on, you know, on their side of things. And so, what we're doing then in HL7, uh, you know, to kind of help all that happen is we're, one of the things we need to do is update the, the FHIR IPS implementation guide. You know, we've, as I said, we've learned from our experience with balloting and review and the testing so far, and we're planning an STU update uh, based on that, that feedback. And again, we hope to publish that, you know, quite soon, maybe within, hopefully within the next month or, or very soon thereafter. And I just listed some of the things that we're, we're trying to deal with in that update, uh, fix you know, some issues that we've you know, had with uh, you know, kind of trying to keep up with the Fire IG publisher. It's not always been an easy task. I'm sure many of us know that. I mean, it's, it's, a great, uh, it, it's great to have it. It's great that it moves, moves so fast, but it, it can be pretty hard to keep up with. And some of the slicing that we were doing early on uh, seemed to be you know, perfectly fine, but it, it turns out that it doesn't, you know, the current uh, publisher and validator don't really like it so well the way it is and it doesn't it actually isn't really compliant with the, with the original intention of the spec so we're, we're fixing that we're making particularly slicing of non-repeating codable concept elements and so we're we're going to do that to make the, the validator a lot happier and we basically have already done that it's just it's not in the official uh, published version yet so that's on things like condition uh, dot code we're also looking at some of the constraints that we had and finding that some of those were not absolutely necessary. Some of them were legacy, maybe incorporated over from CDA and, or, or you know, other places. And we're trying to you know, not overly constrain things when we don't need to. 
And, you know, because that can raise issues with being incompatible with the U.S. core or other specifications and things like the vaccination certificates and all that. And we're looking at our must support and trying to revise it and use it, you know, you know, a little more parsimoniously just when it's really needed and when it's really useful. We're also, we've uh, converted our IG source to, to fish by our shorthand. And uh, that's just recently been done. And again, that'll be put into the, um, you know, into the you know, published version and the, the CI build here, here soon. Uh, you know, MITRE's done a great amount of great work on that and it's, and it's a great set of tools and it's, it makes it easier for uh, people to contribute. So we're happy to, to do that. And we're also working on updating our terminologies, including the SNOMED CT GPS to their current versions. And uh, along with you know, further updates, um, I guess I duplicated that one row, but that's all right. Uh, we're also going to move the uh, some of the bit of IG specific terminology that we have. We're going to take it, uh, move it out of our, you know, being kind of siloed in our IG out to uh, THO, you know, it's just terminology.hl7.org. It's our new basically source of truth for HL7 vocabulary and also known as the UTG. Uh, universal terminology governance is where that came from. We'll do that wherever it's appropriate, particularly our absent and unknown data code system is a, is a candidate for this. And we'll try to generalize that and make it available for others to find and use, you know, where, the, where it may be useful to them. So we're working, doing all that work. And we've, to help folk further our, our implementations, you know, work in GDHP, we're, we've, we're setting up, we have done one and we're setting up another mini connectathon, just a, a fairly short, just a four hour time block, but to, to further get everybody, you know, that's working on, at least within the GDHP context together and connected and trying to further the IPS implementation efforts in their various, you know, countries and territories. And uh, we plan to, intersperse those with the larger events in, H in HL7 and IHE, you know, the connectathons and kind of build and leapfrog, you know, each of those events will you know, learn from, you know, and move forward with uh, all, all that we get out of all of these uh, events. And we want to leverage the common tool suites as much as we can, uh, you know, kind of promote the familiarity with some tools like Inferno and the IHE Gazelle suite for testing and conformance. And so again, our first mini connectathon we had uh, in May and this last month, and then we have the next one coming up either later this month or uh, or maybe early July uh, following the IG Europe connectathon, which is next week. And uh, one of our biggest challenges, uh, which is a common challenge that many people have, but it, particularly when you're dealing with an international specification is trying to decide on what are gonna be our common terminologies. It's a really difficult, but a very necessary step. You know, we didn't really address that in detail in the initial phase, because really we couldn't, as we were just building the initial specification. But now really is the time to, to take a serious, you know, look at how, to, at how to get that done. And so right now we're working on that within GDHP, but we expect that to be extended a lot more broadly and hopefully ultimately globally, uh, you know, as we can move on forward from that, we'll start you know, there and we'll, we'll move as far as we can. But what, what kind of things can we standardize? I mean, can we, could we get people to agree on using SNOMED CT for representing medications and allergies and conditions and immunizations, for example, and maybe uh, standardize on LOINC for observation code? And for some of us, those are kind of no brainers, but not for everyone. And, uh, you know, but in order to achieve the visions that we have for IPS, we really have to solve this Tower of Babel problem. And so uh, we're, we're trying to take that on right now. Okay. And we wanna collaborate with other related projects. I'm mentioning uh, uh, a very similar sounding project, International Patient Access, IPA. And Graham uh, you know, originated this uh, in order basically to internationalize the patient data access features of, of US Core um, and uh, you know, I've, there's a link to the spec there. And this is basically intended to provide a secure API access to a broad range of patient data. Uh, national specifications such as US Core may be able to build on top of that. And it's a, a, a different but related project to IPS. The IPA is about the access to data and IPS is about the content. But IPS definitely, <clears throat> definitely needs IPA because IPS really needs data. 
And so IPS expects to be completely compatible with, with IPA, but is also not intending to have, avoid having a direct dependency. And that's in order to pre preserve the maximum amount of implementation flexibility. But IPA should be able to be helpful in handling the security and provenance considerations that you know, certainly something like IPS has to address. All right, we're just about done here, but uh, we want to engage with vendors, but this has been a, a bit of a difficult task so far, moving rather slowly. But there is some encouragement with that. I mean, we've seen some, some positivity. And uh, next week in the IHE Connectathon, there'll be four European vendors testing the IHE IPS fire profile. So that's great. And we need to at least get at least one, another major vendor, uh, you know, this could be in the U.S. or could be somewhere else, but to step up and, you know, see if we can start moving uh, forward with, uh, you know, with really serious vendor involvement. And we want to look at, you know, what we can do in the area of reference implementations, basically what kind of things can we build? You know, can we work with open source HR projects, maybe like OpenMRS and others, work on this, with the servers, with like Happy. You know, we do intend to build out a, you know, the ability to do document bundle transaction capability and happy right now that's can't quite uh, do that directly on the bundle endpoint as a transaction, but that we also have a, a proposed uh, summary operation on the patient resource that uh, came out of the, the fire connectathon uh, a month or two ago and we're going to try to get an implementation of that working in happy you know, basically it can generate an, an IPS instance for a particular patient based on existing data and some set of rules. Those rules could be either already defined in the server or could be specified by, you know, operation parameter. But we, in, in some way or another, those rules, you know, need to answer that question of what's relevant, you know, for what data do you need to include in a summary? So that's what that's for. And we want to expand our community and basically promote and encourage the use uh, of, of the Zulip you know, chat we have for the IPS, what we call community of practice. And we also have an IPA stream for the, you know, for, for that as well. And our weekly calls uh, in HL7 meetings were also now extending and we did it today, actually, just a couple hours ago um, to also include the work on IPA. And we want to develop both of those projects, you know, closely together and, you know, ideally we'll have some, you know, overlap uh, in the project teams and quite a bit of, you know, cross-pollination basically. All right, so in order to do all this, we need you and uh, it'd be great if some of you would be interested in, in participating and joining. This is where you'd find our weekly and bi-weekly meetings. The bi-weekly is a, the larger cross-SDO one and the weekly is a more technical one to look at IPS and IPA and move those standards forward. So, with that, I'm basically done. And if, you know, during dev days or, or afterwards, you can certainly reach me by email. You can, you know, I'll try to remember to look at the HOVA app speakers gallery if you wanna reach me there and certainly on Zulip you can. So please do that. And we can have, I think a few minutes for Q and A. I believe we still have a little bit left. We do have one question. Okay. A two part question Is US Core inconsistent with IPS? In what ways? Oh, that's a great question. And um, I will only give you a partial answer to the question, basically. Uh, what I will say is there are some inconsistencies, um, but I think they're relatively small. And our stated goal is to basically remove, uh, if possible, all inconsistencies except for ones that are, you know, basically part and parcel of the nature of the specification. And what I mean by that is that we have to expect that there will be some differences in, you know, you know a US specific terminology compared, you know, compared to what would be uh, you know, in a universal standard, you know, an international standard. So, you know, US core will specify say RX norm, um, IPS internationally is not going to specify ARX norm. It's going to, you know, so a US core instance with an ARX norm code would need to be transformed to the standard that would be uh, ultimately decided on in, in IPS. But it's only those kind of cons inconsistencies that we expect to, to maintain. But there's, it's a development process to, to, to get all the other ones, you know, basically, you know, taken care of. So we're, it's a work in progress. And uh, I, I probably can't give you any additional details right now, but I'd be happy to talk more about it later.
and kind of I think I saw a hand from Mark Kramer. I don't know. I'll unmute Mark. Oh, terrific. I was I was muted and I couldn't yeah. do anything about it. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the information, Rob. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I was gonna say just in comment to your last answer, um, you know, having RX norm as a medication isn't necessarily inconsistent. It depends how constrained the IPS is. Of course, you know that. Yeah. You know, just just in sort of a utopian world, the US would feel that it is part of the world and actually base US core on the international standard. Uh, but of course we know we're, we're a singular country. Um, and I'm just, uh, my question really was how far are we from, uh, you know, is there any interest on the US core side to actually do that? I mean, we all have limited, you know, um, bandwidth and, you know, and, and, and kind of, we have our own priorities. So it's, it's a little hard maybe to come together. I mean, I mean, ideally IAPS would maybe have had more in-depth discussions with the U S core team than we actually have had. I mean, we'd like to, and I, I, I assume they would like to as well. Um, but we have had some, you know, review work, you know, pretty good review work, review work done to look where the differences are between those two two specifications and we have made some you know, you know commitments to try to address any issues that really don't need to be there we, we don't want any barriers to be there uh, unless there's really you know a, a good reason that they should be but it'll take a while to get to the that ideal point i don't know if that fully answered the question or not maybe not but do we have any others or any more on that There was a follow-up question. Does IPS include guidance to access an active medication list, or maybe that is for IPA? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we were honestly, we're, you know, the IPA bit of this is really new. I mean, it's literally only um, been pulled out of kind of Graham's GitHub repository just in the last few weeks, uh, you know, really pretty much less than a month. And we're just starting, trying to get things starting to, to move on it. So we don't have full answers on that, how that's gonna work and how exactly IPA, S and IPA will fit together in all aspects. But essentially IPS has left those access questions to other development work and standards. And so IPA is a perfect fit for that. And we, IPS would expect to leverage, you know, what um, IPA uh, is going to be able to provide in, in you know, in that regard. So I think they should fit pretty much hand in glove, you know, and that's what our intent is. Okay, we have a reply. Many of us IPS implement implementers believe that IPS needs a resource that implements a medication list and that use case is best served by medication statement. <laughs> However, that has been replaced by in R5 by medication usage. This is a hot topic. I'm guessing that US Corps moved to medication request for that reason, but many outside the US need lists that include more than prescribing data. Well, that's a really interesting question, and it definitely is a hot topic. Um, I will have to say, I think that's not why U.S. Corps moved, because they moved long before uh, R5 was even, you know, a, a gleam in anyone, even Graham's eye, I think. Um, and so that wasn't a direct dependency there, but certainly the, the fact of what U.S. Corps done is in, certainly has a lot of influence in what the solution should be. Uh, well, yeah, we are, we're actively discussing at this point what, you know, should be the right answer for this as we you know, say, as IPS moves into R5 and, and as the rest of us do, we've got medication usage now replacing medication statement. Um, and we still have the issue of, you know, 
you know, US Corps using medication request. And so we have we have work to do there. That is an area of inconsistency. That's maybe one of the maybe the biggest one, maybe you know, certainly one of the biggest ones. Um, we, we need to get in, you know, get a handle on this. And that's again subject of active work and discussion right now. Love to get any uh, use, any input to help us, you know, in finding out the, the best solution for that. So I've noticed that Brett Marquard has included a link in the Q&A and then he made another comment. So actually, okay. Brett, I have uh, <laughs> you can unmute. Hey, thanks, Dave. Thanks, Rob. This is a great talk. Hey, I mean, I think the medication list concept, it's, it's quite complex. And I think yeah. there are several resources in uh, the to, to pull together an accurate medication list. We basically put a lot of time and effort into developing this medication list guidance and ultimately settled on using medication requests to, pro to provide these are the active medications. And so it wasn't that we didn't, and there's some reason why we moved from statement, um, but it, it's quite nuanced in the standards world. Uh, so I would hope that whatever is done going forward would take the lessons that, uh, that we've learned there because you know we would happily adopt a single way to access the active medication list. Yeah. Well, I think there's certainly no question that we will try to learn from U.S. Corps experience. It's a, it's a major asset and, you know, it's, you know, obviously incredibly important and, you know, regardless of, you know, exactly how, you know, decisions were made back when they were made and all that. I mean, we have to, you know, take, we have to go from where we are and, and figure out what's the right thing. And so I think that, you know, IPS at the time and the U.S. Corps kind of uh, came at it from two different, you know, ends of the spectrum, probably in some re some regard. But but I think that um, we can find a middle place where everyone, you know, everyone can live happily together, basically. And I think that's I think it's possible. And I think that's basically the, the goal. I mean, we would so we would probably I mean, this is really off the cuff. I mean, so don't you know, hold me to anything I say here, but um, I would think that we certainly probably, you know, we will consider at least the possibility of including uh, something explicit for medication request in IPS. But I will also say that we've never excluded it. Um, it's, it's always been allowed. It's just not been highlighted, you know, as necessarily the preferred option in IPS, but it, it certainly can be used. But the problem is we've got to, we all have to, we all know we have to agree on a, you know, something that's at least um, a commonly workable approach. Otherwise we're not going to be interoperable. So we've got to figure out if, you know, how to make that uh, meet in the middle a little more cleanly. I think that's the main thing. So Rob and everyone, I know we're at time here for this session. There is one new question by Walter and we can continue this discussion in this Zoom session. Nobody's gonna take it away from us. Um, so those who are have to leave, please rate the session. Um, even my pitiful performance of mm -hmm. introducing Rob because I was talking to mute and I never realized it. So I, I apologize for the clunky start, but um, let's get to, the, to uh, Walter's question. He said, how is the transition, no, I'm sorry. How is the translation extension in coding IPS is meant to be used? Build in by the client or supported by terminology servers? Wow, <clears throat> that's quite a question. I mean, it's a great question. Um, I, I think I don't have a, a really clear answer to it, but I can say a couple of things. Um, you know, I mean, I think we have, basically IPS has always recognized the need for being able to deal with language translations. Um, you know, I, you know, it's, I mean, it's great to have interoperability at the code level, and it's super important, you know, to do that. But you know, also at the display level, uh, you know, when we're dealing with, you know, different languages between you know providers one and the other, I, I think that certainly human language translation is is part of it. Again, we have tried to make provision in the specification to allow for what would need to be done there, but have also tried not to specify exactly what needs to be done and when and exactly how it is to be done. That's more of an implementation issue. And it's more of a question now that it's time to start really grappling with. So whether it's done by the machine or done some other way, I don't know. Uh, I'm guess the answer is both. 
and we need to figure out what scenarios are you know you know actually you know will work the best that's part of what our connectathon and implementation experience needs to tell us and uh, we you know we haven't exercised that area nearly as enough you know yet in the connectathon so uh, particularly if anyone has has a particular interest in that that would be great to get your help and participation or at least some comments on it but yeah it's something that we, we will be definitely addressing and hopefully being able to provide some useful guidance you know, for that which we haven't really done to, to date but we know that we we want to do that thanks rob that does um pretty much sum up the q a i see peter jordan did add another comment to the original question of, is us core inconsistent with ips and in what ways so rob if i could ask you to after um the session here if you could hop in that q a section of whova and provide any of your insights to those replies i think that would kind of complete the circle on that sure i can do that all right well thank you and thank you everyone yes Have thanks a great everyone day.